This passage, I think, is one of the most misunderstood passages in the church. Uh, it can be a little bit controversial, especially the way that some people interpret this passage. As a matter of fact, not a little bit. It is without question controversial, and it's just wrong the way that some misinterpret this passage. They misunderstand this passage. This is Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Now, remember what's happening. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit has been poured out onto the apostles. They begin speaking in these languages, and people from different places who speak different languages hear the word of God being preached to them as they said their words, they hear them magnifying God, the Lord, in their own language. So these men have the spirit of God upon them, given utterance as the spirit leads them to, to speak in these languages to magnify God. Then there are those who are wondering, well, this is amazing. This sounds awesome. What does this mean? What's happening? So you got people there that don't know what was said. And so Peter gets up and tells them. He gives them one. He explains why this is happening in, in regards to what Joel said in, in Joel chapter two. Then after that, he says, based not why, but now what? And so what does he do? He does what Jesus said they're going to do, and they're going to testify of him. Remember, that's the whole point that Jesus is trying to give to them as he meets them in Acts 1. He says that they'll be his witnesses. And so now he's being, Peter stands up and, and is being a witness to what Jesus did. So now we come to the end after he's made those statements in Acts chapter 2. Let's start in verse 37 to kind of keep it in context even more so. He says, now when they heard this, heard what? What Peter was giving them, which was the proclamation of the gospel. They were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what must, what shall we do? Now, a couple of things. Here's an example of, because I think we need to take note of this. Every time that the word brethren is used, or in this case, Andres, men, to refer to brothers, brethren, men, it does not always refer to someone who is of the same elk, meaning that they're not always Christians calling someone else a brethren. There, it's, it's, it, it can be used as a general statement, a general term, not to imply that, hey, we are the, of the same belief. We see that because they're calling them brethren, and they're not brethren, at least yet. So he says, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent, each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is where it gets a little bit controversial. There's some misunderstanding. Is one, is he saying, take step one, then step two, and then step three, meaning step one would be repent, step one, two, be baptized, and step three, receive the Holy Spirit. Are those steps, are those things that we're ordered to do? And then another issue that comes up also is baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So there are those that will take this and you have a basic reading. Look at it and say, okay, I can see this. And there's a reason why I can see why people think that there's a step, step one, step two, and then step three. And then there are those that will say that the words that are spoken over someone that's being baptized, it must be in the name of Jesus. Now, let's deal with that first. The Bible is not saying to do so and to, as a magic word, magic elixir, to say in the name of Jesus over the person that's, that's uh, baptizing you. And it's certainly not saying that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. We're going to look at that as well. That's a third issue with this passage because some folks think that that's what's being spoken of. But as far as baptizing them of Christ, if you have to be baptized in water to be saved and you have to say the name of Jesus over the person that's baptizing you, then we've got a problem. The problem is that if that is the case, then now your salvation depends on one, not just your profession of faith and your faith in Christ, which is what we're always told, faith alone. But then it also depends upon another person's action that you have to actually physically be, be baptized in water. And then three, the person that's doing it has to say in the name of Jesus. Now, what if they say so while you are underwater and you have no idea what was said? Does that mean that what was stated it takes no effect. Does that mean that you are not saved because they said, I don't know, in the name of God or in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? If they said something different, does that mean that you are not saved? That that not, not only is that a works-based salvation because you have to do this to get saved, it's really a double work salvation if you think about it because it's not just you that has to do it, but it's also another person who has to do it the right way. It becomes ritualistic in order for you to be saved. Well, that's not what he's saying. 
when we talk about in the name of Jesus, let's go ahead and pull this up. Let's go to Acts 316 so we can kind of understand what this what this means in the name of. And so in 316, notice what he says. And on the basis of faith in his name, on the basis of faith in this word is epe te piste to onomatos, which is on the in the on the basis of or upon his name or in the name. Uh, it is the name of Jesus, which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. How is it the name of Jesus? Well, faith based on what Christ has done. So when we say in the name of something, the word name refers to not just nomenclature, Bob, Mary, Joe, Frank. No, it also refers to reputation, what someone has done. So on the basis of what Christ has done, this is why someone is being baptized or we walk or we do this in the name of the Lord. Remember, this term is brought up all throughout the scriptures. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself says to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, is that one command that's never observed or adhered to? Because he says he tells his disciples to do so, and we don't have a passage in the Bible where they're actually doing so. Well, yes, they are. He's not saying to say verbatim in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. He's not saying that. He's not saying to baptize three times, what have you. He's not even signifying being baptized in water. We'll get to that in a second, but what he's saying on the basis of what's happened, on the basis of Jesus Christ, what he has done, this is what your faith is in. That's why he says, and on the basis of faith, again, or upon, this word basis is epe, or on or upon, uh, upon uh, the faith, or in this faith, or the basis of this faith in Jesus' name. Because of what he's done, we have salvation. And so we go back to Acts 2.38. Peter said to them, repent each of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So he's not saying be baptized and verbally verbatim these words come out of your mouth. Because again, now we're dependent upon the person that's baptizing you that they say the right thing. And so in that regard, we should easily be able to put to put to bed this notion that you have to verbally say that. I know there are going to be those who are going to still say that, and that's fine. That is fine. I won't fight that fight with them because some people just might not be ready to listen or want to listen. It's also been kind of historically understood that that's what this means uh, on the basis of epe, uh, anoma, or entois uh, These These are ways of saying upon the basis because of what you've done. Now, the other issue is, is this giving a step-by-step -step instruction? What we have here is what's called an exegetical use of the Kai, and we see this. When we look at this word Kai, and this might be a little bit hard to follow, so, so let me just move slowly if I can. When we look in the Greek and we look at this word Kai, let's find it right here. If you notice below me, there are it's the, the definition of it. You have and, also, even, and yet, but, as well as namely. Now, when we say that, you can say this and this kind of in a chronological order, or you can say this and this kind of equating the two. What I mean by that, as far as equating the two or making it ep exegetical or another word, resumptive, it's just another way of stating the same thing. For example, let me give you an example of something that is resumptive or ep exegetical. Uh, in Acts 2.23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge. Well, the and is not saying that there are two different things is being stated, the definite plan and foreknowledge. It's just redescribing what this is. The definite plan and foreknowledge are the same thing. OK, so that's why this this is kind of giving an idea of what this ep exegetical Kai is. It's saying the same thing in two different ways. For example, if we say our Lord and Savior, we're saying the same thing. We're just describing him a different way. We're saying so we might use two words. We might use three words to describe the singular person or thing. Similarly, we have in Ephesians 1.1 1, 1, uh, to the saints who are at Ephesus and are and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. This word and is used there also. And so we see the excess. Remember, the saints are the ones that are faithful. So if you are a saint, you are faithful in Christ. If you are faithful in Christ, you are a saint. It's just saying the same word. It's sometimes how we would use words kind of in a flowery sense as a way of address sometimes we might just use more words that are necessary just to make our point um, pretty clear. And so we see that as well. So go back to it. That's what we're having here. 
We're not getting a step-by-step guide for someone to be saved. It has to be done in this order. And we're going to soon find out why it cannot be taken that this is the order that has to happen. One, you have to repent. Well, now that's always been the clarion call to repent. And remember, we are told that repentance is granted to us. How so? Well, something is happening to our heart to where our hearts are changed, are pierced. Well, what just happened here? Uh, It just says they were pierced to the heart. Something happened to them as they are hearing this gospel. They were pierced. And notice if we go back to verse 37, this being pierced is passive. So something happens to their heart. Well, what could this possibly be? Well, remember, Jesus makes a statement that what has to happen is that you have to be born in the heart from above. It's always been stated. Now, God has stated in the past for them to do so on their own, like in Deuteronomy 10, circumcise your heart, get your heart right, fix your heart. He's always made that statement, but he's also come along just as he said that statement to them to do so. He's also said that he will also do it as well. He will be the one that ultimately is going to circumcise their heart, that's going to put a new spirit in their heart wash their heart with water, fix their heart, cleanse their heart, circumcise their heart. He stated that he was going to do so. So here we have them hearing the word and now their heart is pierced. And so he says, so we make the statement, repent. Now at this moment, the heart is repentant. The heart has been uh, regenerated. And so you make the statement of faith and then we can see what happens because as you repent, the Bible says, and be baptized. Well, at the moment, at the confession of your faith, you are baptized. Remember what he says in Acts 1, Jesus is meeting the disciples, the apostles on their way or telling them what he's going to happen to them in just a little bit. He says, for John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. John has always stated that I baptize you with water, but Jesus is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Remember, you are not saved if you do not have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you are not saved. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, we were all made to drink of one Spirit. That includes the person who has not yet even been baptized in physical water. It's not the physical water that saves you. It is the spiritual water, which is what Paul, I'm sorry, Peter brings up in 1 Peter stating or showing that water baptism or water has been used and some symbolically as a symbol to what really saves you. What really saves you is a spirit baptism. This answer of a good conscience towards God comes as a result of being baptized in the spirit. So every person where they've been saved for one minute, one day, one hour, one year, what have you, all have been baptized in the Holy Spirit by who? By Jesus. So it's not us that actually baptizes into the spirit, it is the the, uh, the the son who does so. And so he says, repent, each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus on the basis of what's happened for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Now again, we keep seeing this, this word Kai show up. Here it is, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus. And there it is again, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Let's go to the right so we can see the, the, the Kai. Here's the Kai for the and receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, then we go up a little bit further. We see the Kai also again, Kai and be baptized. And so what's going to happen is, or what's being stated here, repent also being baptized, namely, even as you are receiving the Holy Spirit. Again, your profession of faith brings the Holy Spirit to you. Now, if a person thinks that the order is repent first, two, be baptized, three, receive the Holy Spirit, Well, we've got a problem because in Acts 10, verse 44, we see Peter preaching to the Gentiles. And what happens? While Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. Now, they eventually they go and they're baptized in verse 47. Surely no one can refuse water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit. So notice they have already received the Holy Spirit. And so next they're going to be baptized in water with this baptism in water is an outward expression of what's taking place inwardly that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. If you just get baptized and there is no Holy Spirit, then all you did was just get wet. You got some water on you. That was it. Not having the Holy Spirit means not having the not having the Lord. Paul says in Romans 8, if you don't have the Spirit, you are not a son of God. You are not if you're not led by the Spirit, you are not his. And so it's imperative that you must have the Holy Spirit. Well, who has the Holy Spirit? Everyone uh, that has placed their faith in Christ. 
at the name of Jesus. And so that person receives the Holy Spirit. Now, is, is that to say that baptism is not important? No, it's not to say that at all. But it is to put water baptism in its proper context, especially as it relates to spirit baptism. We see a lot of times uh, throughout the Bible, people placing their faith in Christ. And then the Bible doesn't tell us about them being baptized. Acts 13, 48 says that when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, they believe. But this issue of baptism doesn't show up there. Uh, we can look in other places where, such as in Acts 19, 5, Paul said, John, Bap John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, the question is, how were they baptized? Is this speaking of a water baptism or a spirit baptism? In this case, it's a little bit ambiguous. It's a little bit hard to understand. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking uh, in these languages and prophesying. They were all about 12 men. Now, these are the disciples of, of John. These are people that have heard about John's baptism. What happens? They receive the Holy Spirit not as a result of being baptized in water because they had already been baptized in water some time ago. They were baptized in water likely prior to, matter of fact, not likely, but definitely prior to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. All they know of was John's baptism, this baptism of repentance. Well, if that brought about the Holy Spirit, they hadn't gotten it yet, but they received the Holy Spirit at the laying on of hands by the disciples. And then to make this point even clearer about how important spirit baptism is versus water baptism. Paul makes this statement, if water baptism was important, Paul says something pretty odd here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 17. He says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in deliverance of speech, I'm sorry, not in cleverness of, cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. So Paul is coming to preach the gospel. He says, I'm not coming to baptize. Well, that'd be pretty strange if you have to be baptized in order to be saved. That would be an incomplete gospel. That would be an incomplete act saying, here, believe the gospel, but don't worry about baptism because even though baptism is important and you must be saved by it, but he didn't come to baptize and he wasn't baptizing because the point is if a person places their faith in Christ, once they hear the gospel, receive the gospel, place their faith in that very same gospel, what Christ did, then we know that that person is taken by the Lord. He's the one that baptizes us for salvation, which is why John makes a statement I'm baptizing you in water, but Jesus will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So place upon your faith in Christ, upon the name of Christ, you are baptized into the Holy Spirit. So now when we go back and look at 2 Peter, I'm sorry, 2 Peter, Acts 2.38, Peter says, repent each of you um, as being, and, the, and this is how you would take this, repent each and every one of you or each of you as being baptized um, in the name of Jesus. Remember, that's kind of what the and means. Uh, also being baptized, so repent each of you also being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ uh, for the forgiveness of your sin, which is or namely so that in order that you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is all kind of one big act. When you repent, the Bible knows of no person who is a believer who's not repentant. The Bible knows of no person who's a believer who's not uh, who has not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, does the Bible know of anyone that has been uh, who's a Christian, who saved, who hasn't been baptized? Well, again, we don't have the account of everyone that was baptized or that believed if they did baptize. We do have the account, obviously, of the thief on the cross. And some will say, well, he was baptized or he was saved prior to um, this, this, this new dispensation. But that's not true because this for Jews, the covenant, the new covenant was inaugurated and the old covenant was abolished or done away with at his death. Remember what the, the book of Hebrews says, that uh, it is the death that ratifies a this testament. And so this covenant for them was, was inaugurated at his death. Je remember, Jesus preceded the thief on the cross in, into the grave. He, he died first. And so the shedding of his blood, giving up the Holy Spirit, him saying, it is finished, that's done before the thief on the cross. So when the thief on the cross died, it was in the current dispensation that all people find themselves in after the cross, placing their faith in Christ. He did so then. So therefore, it wouldn't be a good argument to say, well, he died or he died at a different time under different dispensations so forth. That's not true either. But this point right here is to say that you must repent. Uh, in doing so, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit.
That's really all this is. It's not to say that you have to have someone come and say verbally in the name of Jesus. It has to be a water baptism. Otherwise, you're not saved. That will eliminate a lot of people from the opportunity to be saved. you got those that might be in prison that cannot come to Christ then, that cannot be saved because they can't be baptized. you got those in other places in the world that cannot be. And so what do we do for them? They're just out of luck? No. Upon the profession of your faith, that's why he says, what, was, what must we do to be saved? And Peter answers, believe on him, believe on Christ. That is the central message of the gospel. Place your faith in him. And then baptism, water baptism has its place as an outward declaration to what's been done to you. Amen.